Baba Tunde Olalire Badamosi, popularly called BOG, is a real estate developer and a politician. Born into the Badamosi family in Ikorodu on the 15th of October 1967, he attended K. Cotton Memorial Nursery and Primary School, Government College Lagos, and Lagos State School of Basic Studies, Ikeja. The quality of the education was amazing. I remember entering Government College Lagos and wondering how they were able to put all of this equipment together. I was but a young one then. I was about 11 years old um, back in the day. And it was just amazing to me. You know, the language laboratory, I remember entering that at Government College Lagos, the woodwork uh, workshop, the art room, you know, the quality of education and the quality of teachers that we had. You know, these guys were seasoned professionals. Um, I remember feeling like I had stepped into another world, you know, coming from primary school, which was a private primary school, by the way, and moving to a government-run and a government-owned secondary school. It was just amazing. Um, and throughout my secondary school years, except for the short stint that I had at Government College Victoria Island, which was more of a makeshift school, um, everything was just good. It was good. It was only in the later years, I think uh, 84 to 85, that I began to feel like, okay, the quality was dropping off just a bit. Um, but, you know, uh, my secondary school experience was good. And the teachers that we had were of very, very high quality. I'll forever be grateful to my English teacher, Miss Inyo. And... Um, this was a woman who knew how to discover rough diamonds and turn them into valuable gems. Missing you, pick me up. Um, I had a bit of a confidence crisis at the time I joined Government College Ikorodu, having been moved around so much uh, as a child. But Missing you picked me up and brushed me up and realized that I had some talents uh, and I had a unique insight into life in general. I, I had a unique perspective from which I looked at everything. So she decided that um, I needed to join the debating team, especially when she, when she saw my writing, you know. Um, so I joined the debating team of Government College Ikurutu. And uh, in the course of time, over a period of about a year or so, we became debating champions at various different debating contests. Uh, including the one at Lagos State Television, uh, Lagos Television, LTV8, back in the day, when they were still on Awolawa Road, uh, Awolawa Way in Ikeja. And then uh, there was the NTA Channel 7 debate, which took place at the Museum Kitchen, uh, uh, superintended in those days by the late uh, Tunde Kuboye of Jazz Ho of uh, Jazz 38 fame. And then there was the Lagos State Ministry of Health debates, which, in which we lost in the final to uh, the lady who was to eventually become Miss Nigeria, uh, Benedicta Adebowale. So yes, it was, it was a very interesting time. And I, I remember that epoch of my life with a lot of fondness. Married to Shade Badamosi. I met my wife at her younger sister's birthday party in the year 1999. And a few months later, we were married. So he has a beautiful smile. And that, that got my attention, definitely. Trepidation, fear, you know, um, how is he or she going to turn out and so on. But she's turned out well. Babatunde worked in various fields in the UK from 1990 to 1998. Well, my name is Babatunde Olalirik Badamosi, and I was born in 1967 in the city of London to the family of Fatai Kayode Badamosi and Jemilat Badamosi. I was raised primarily in Lagos. I went to primary school at the Kekotun Nursery and Primary School of Body Thomas in Suruliri. I then proceeded to Government College Lagos, and soon after that, I was transferred to Government College Victoria Island. My secondary school education was quite nomadic. 
I ended up at Government College Ikorodu. And from there, I completed my secondary education and proceeded to Lagos State University in Ocho. In 1989, I left Lagos State University, not having finished my law program, unfortunately, and proceeded to the United Kingdom in 1990. And there I stayed for 17 years. I returned to Nigeria in 2007 with my family after 17 years in the United Kingdom. And it's been an interesting roller coaster ride since then. We've built an estate, Amen Estate. It's, I think, perhaps a most iconic estate in Africa at the moment. And we have continued on with our investment in real estate. But despite that, we find that there are many factors that militate against development in Lagos State. And we are now poised to address those issues on the political front, perhaps as governor of Lagos State. Before finally giving way to his entrepreneurial instincts by setting up his first business, a mini cab firm. Shortly after, he started a recruitment agency with his wife, East Tech Limited and East Tech College, which gave him an insight into the IT industry and formed the foundation into his next foray into business. Well, I'd done all sorts of jobs initially when I landed in the UK. We started with all the usual menial jobs, eventually graduated to some more serious jobs. Then I worked with the London Underground as a station assistant for a while. That afforded me the opportunity to take a closer look at UK society, um, up close and personal. Um, and then eventually I got into, because I needed to be independent, I needed my time to myself, so I decided that I would be a cab driver. Um, of course, in a society where the roads are really good, you know, cab driving is a really profitable uh, engagement for those who, know their, who knew their way around in the days before Google Maps and Waze and Uber and the rest of it. So yes, I decided to go into cab driving to give myself more time for other pursuits. And eventually, after studying the uh, cab office model for a while, I realized that I could actually run my own office instead of working for somebody else, and that's exactly what I did. I saved up enough money, got an office on Highbury Grove uh, near the Arsenal Stadium, and we started. Well, initially we ran the two businesses concurrently and then eventually I decided that the recruitment um, firm seemed to be the more profitable and of course because of the time that I needed to spend with uh, my partner at the time, I decided that it was better to go with the recruitment firm and rest the cab firm and that's exactly what I did. In an organized economy, you have access to all the basics. We had landlines, we had, you know, internet was just coming into its own at the time. Email was just coming into its own at the time. And um, our initial offering as a recruitment firm was to do more with blue collar work, hotel staff and, you know, this type of people. But eventually, you know, uh, I think it was uh, Perot, Perot Consulting who were an outsourcing firm for a lot of financial institutions in the UK and across the world indeed at the time, um, contacted us because they wanted uh, first line uh, help desk people for the IT desks of a number of banks in the city of London. And so we got on the books of Peru and we began to supply them with staff and the rest as they say is history. The information technology firm was originally started by his wife, Shadi. Babatunde later joined her in the business and grew it into a viable and strong IT brand. He introduced and grew the Oracle Financial Unit from a training business to a consultancy. I did not actually travel to the United Kingdom for further studies. I traveled out of Nigeria because of the trauma that I experienced at Lasso due to the police invasion of the university at the time. It took me quite a while to recover from that. 
But suffice it to say that I found myself in the UK eventually. When I say I found myself, I mean I discovered who I was. And um, I discovered that I was more attuned to business than academics. So I focused all my attention on business. Um, first as an IT recruiter, then as uh, an IT training facilitator, training certification and consultancy. And uh, on the side, you know, I've always been a trader, a businessman. And coming from the Badamosi family, I could not be anything but. So on the side, I was always investing in property as well. It was natural for me to come back to Nigeria to invest in property at the end of my stay in the United Kingdom, obviously. The college was able to train over 100 consultants in Oracle applications like AP, AR, and GL to help plug a yawning skills gap in the corporate market. Well, my father was not much of a businessman himself. His father was. Um, my father was not as interested in, uh, how do you say, money as his father and his siblings were. He was more interested in the community, so he was a community leader in Ikorudu. Um, I took, I, I, I want to believe that perhaps I took more after my grandfather and his mother, my great-grandmother, uh, the great Yalasho of Ikorudu. And um, also I find that a lot of my cousins have, are, are treading the same path that I've treaded, and a lot of my own younger siblings are also following along that route. Um, into business. So, yes, the family has a pedigree in business, but the family also has a pedigree in public service. Um, my aunt was once the director of public prosecutions at the Federal Ministry of Justice, and also at one time she was the Attorney General of Lagos State, having been the first Nigerian woman to get a master's degree in law. My famous uncle, Rashid Badamosi, was an industrialist of note himself. Um, and he was a technocrat, a very highly recognized technocrat across the world, um, also helping the federal government to midwife the Petroleum Products Pricing and Regulatory Agency uh, during the Obasanjo administration of the uh, late 90s and early 2000s. A decline in funding of education as a direct result of the Gulf War helped hasten the decision to sell up East Tech and leave the UK all the profits were used to build up a small portfolio of property consisting of residential and commercial units dotted around the southeast of London. It was a number of reasons. First of all, uh, we had newly become a democracy, okay, and I participated heavily in ensuring that that came to pass, uh, having been a member of NADECO, especially in 1995 um, and going forward. Um, so we'd become a democracy, and then my children had come, the twins, you know, and um, I just, there were a number of laws that were passed in the UK at the time that made me realize that, you know, we needed to take a different look at the way we were going to bring up our children. And so I decided that perhaps it was time to go back to Nigeria to be able to give them the kind of upbringing that I felt that they needed at the time. Um, it was also to do with acculturation, you know, uh, for the children also. And um, so we, we came back to Nigeria for that. But also on the other side, on the business side, uh, the IT training, certification and consultancy business was on the wane a bit. Our property side was doing well, but the IT side was not doing as well. I, you know, these things come in, you know, waves and crests and uh, we were experiencing a lower end of the cycle for the IT business at the time. So we decided that we were going to cash out in that area and um, come to Nigeria. Everything just worked together uh, for our good. So we, we cashed out, we sold up everything, and we brought about a billion uh, naira. It was about four million pounds in the day, in, back in the day. We brought it back to Nigeria, we invested it in real estate, and here we are today. We were already in real estate in the United Kingdom. We were investors, albeit on a smaller scale than we're doing now. Uh, we bought a few homes here and there. At the end, by the time we were leaving the UK, we had over 100 units, if you count them unit by unit, um, all over southeast London. And we sold everything. 
we sold everything. Um, there were some that were uh, just buy to let. There were some where we bought and refurbished. There were some that we bought and uh, basically rebuilt. We knocked them down and rebuilt totally. So we were already into property in the UK. And it was a natural step for us to step into the Nigerian property market, knowing that a large number of people that were buying properties from us in the UK were people who lived in Nigeria but wanted property in the UK uh, for reasons of quality mainly and avail availability of the basics. And if you ask a lot of, if you, well, when we asked a lot of the Nigerian investors coming from Nigeria to buy in the UK uh, at that time, they, they just wanted everything to work. And since things refused to work in Nigeria, they decided to come to the UK. And that's how it was. So we had to come to where the market was, basically. And that's the reason we came to Nigeria. Baba Tunde Badamosi is currently the chairman CEO of Rebrick Homes International Limited, Ibejuleki, Lagos. In every business decision, in every investment decision, you have to always consider your returns on investment and the time for the returns on investment. Now, as a businessman, before I put money anywhere, I look at the cost benefit, I do an analysis of the cost benefit. And if it's not going to work in terms of delivering returns on investment in a reasonable time, then we simply will not sink resources into it. It's as simple as that. Now, as far as um, government investment in infrastructure, in services, in utilities, again, the principle cannot be much different from that applied in business. There has to be a return on investment. Now, the return on investment may be social. It may not be financial. It may not be immediate financial gain for government. It may just be in social gain. For instance, if government decides to invest a certain amount in road infrastructure, say for instance, I'm thinking of the coastal road between Ligali Ayoride uh, Street in Victoria Island, 10 lanes all the way to Odeomi at the border with Ogun State. That's about a 95 kilometer stretch of 10 lane expressway. It's going to cost us somewhere in the region of about 700 million naira per kilometer to execute that at current rates. Okay? Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is 70, is, you know, just below 70 billion, is that going to be worth it for such a road in the Leki Peninsula area? Will it reduce travel times? Okay? Because really, that's the way you have to measure it. Okay? We have to measure it from the point of view of travel time to the average commuter in the Lekki Peninsula area. Will it increase investment in the Lekki Peninsula area? All along the stretch, the 95-kilometer stretch of the road, will we begin to see inward investment, both from uh, Nigerians in Nigeria, Nigerians in the diaspora, and from you know, uh, foreigners who are looking to invest in Nigeria for whatever number of reasons, whether it's tourism or industry or whatever. He ventured into politics a few years ago, precisely in 2010, when he ran for a ticket of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, for the governorship position in 2011 and 2015. I initially joined the PDP in 2008, having supported the Urbani Koro campaign for governorship in Lagos State in 2007. Um, by 2010, I became fully, fully active because I decided that I was going to run for governor, even though I was unknown in the party at the time. But I wanted some issues to be brought to the front burner, like affordable housing, like power, and so on. Um, and I, w I needed that to be debated, you know. So I, I brought it in. I brought those things in as issues in the PDP uh, primary contest. But unfortunately, I thought the PDP was going to organize. Uh, debates for all aspirants, but they didn't. They said they would, but they never did. You know, in 2015, I contested again. This time, I really wanted to, you know, uh, take the ticket and become the governor of Lagos State uh, via the PDP. But the PDP chose a newcomer to the party, and uh, against all our against all our warnings and the better judgment of some senior members of the party, they gave the ticket in the fraudulent primaries to uh, 
you know, the man that ran in, in that, office, in that uh, position on that ticket in 2015. And of course, um, he surrendered the mandate, basically, you know, which is something that we already said was going to happen. Um, going forward, I decided that for a number of issues that were happening at the national level in the PDP, uh, which I tried to intervene in personally by calling the attention of the national leaders of the PDP to some issues that were some vexing issues at the national level. They didn't pay any attention. They allowed the drift to go on such that an agent of the APC ended up becoming the national chairman of the PDP. Uh, at that point, I felt I'd had enough and I threw in the tower. I left partisan politics. And I thought it was for good, but then the, the ADP came calling right after I'd been incarcerated by uh, the APC government for nine days uh, for exposing the rot at the Central Bank of Nigeria with relation to forex transactions. My family are fully in support of my ambition to become governor of Lagos State. Not the least because they know my capabilities, they know what I'm capable of. They are first-hand witnesses to my ability to turn things around uh, most dramatically, especially in the area of the built environment and the area of services and utilities. After an unsuccessful election for Babatunde Badamosi in the 2015 general elections, he resigned from politics in 2016. In 2017, Babatunde Badamosi, leaving no stone unturned, came back to partisan politics to run once again for the office of the governor under the platform of the Action Democratic Party, ADP. The five divisions of Lagos, Ikeja, Badagri, Ikurudu, Lagos, and Ekpe, um, well, which we call Ibile, going by the acronym, have been there from inception and um, we're going to be planning a long-term development along the lines of the geographical divisions of Lagos. As far as the LCDs are concerned, um, anything that will result in job losses, we are going to avoid. So we will be keeping the 57 LCDs in order to ensure that those who are employed in those administrative setups retain, not only retain their jobs, but actually uh, profit more from them because we're going to be handing over all the responsibilities, the constitutional responsibilities of local governments that had been taken away from them by the state government between 1999 and today, we'll return them back to them. So tenement rates, uh, outdoor hoarding and advertising, uh, markets, abattoirs, and so many other things that have been taken away from the local governments will return them back to them so that they can have a solid revenue base from which to operate. Of course, the reason these uh, revenue headers, including waste management, were taken away from the local governments was to create the false impression to the public that Lagos now has uh, a bigger internally generated revenue. It was simply a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul. And we're going to reverse that situation. As far as developmental plans, we have something we're calling the Lagos Integrated Regeneration Plan, in which we've selected uh, eight local governments, six of them for their industrial capacity, and the remaining two, as well as one of the industrial ones, for their tourism potential. So we've selected Oshodi, Solo, Mushi, Ikeja, Ikurudu, Apapa, and Ibejuleki for their industrial capacity. And then for tourism, we've chosen Ibejuleki, uh, Badagri, and Etiosa because, of course, these are the local governments that face the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and we need that coastal area for the development of a tourism industry for Lagos. Um, we will be, in all of these local governments, rebuilding the entire infrastructure, redesigning the roadways, okay, putting in uh, 
localized power so that we'll have captive power in each of these local governments, brand new grids for each one of them. Uh, cables will be run fully underground. There will be no more exposed transformers as we've been used to. We're going to end that. Um, we're going to make sure that each of these local governments is sanitary by providing uh, water so each local government will have their waterworks functioning again. For those who do not have waterworks at the moment, we will be building brand new waterworks for them in order to ensure that every household has access to clean, potable water treated to WHO standards. So that's that about that. We'll also be looking at the telecoms industry. We are in a unique situation of being perhaps the only mega city in the entire world that does not have hardwired, cabled, fiber optic telecoms network. And that's something that we need to address really quickly. The only reason that we do not have that is because of the obstacle that was put in the place of the telecoms companies by something the Lagos State government called the Lagos State Infrastructure Management and Regulatory Agency, LASIMRA. Now, not that we're going to scrap LASIMRA entirely, but we're going to change the mandate of LASIMRA uh, from one of being an obstruction to one of being an enabler. So we're going to be using LASIMRA to work uh, specifically with the telco that has the license for landlines in Lagos. We're going to be helping them lay their cables. Instead of charging them for laying the cables, we're going to be helping them lay the cables. We won't, we won't be charging. Uh, we'll be ensuring that in the midst of all the civil works that we do, we lay trunks and manholes for telecoms cables. And it won't be just the one, it will be several. So that in the event that the uh, NCC, we anticipate that the NCC will allow competition in the area of telecoms. And in that event, there will be more than enough trunking for any telecoms outfit that decides to provide us with landlines in Lagos. We need landlines because we need jobs. The lack of fiber optic cabling, uh, the lack of the fiber optic uh, cabled telephone network has meant that our telecoms cannot really be relied on for mission critical uh, tasks. So that for instance, in the area of call centers, and back office uh, activities, you can't really rely on the telecoms uh, services that we have in Lagos because it's wireless and it's prone to uh, dropped calls and you know uh, weather-related disturbances and things like that. So with the hardwire telecoms, we'll, we'll now be able, well, investors will now be able to compete on the global scale, on the, on the global stage for call center jobs from the financial and other industries. Uh, the international financial industry has a culture of outsourcing their call centers. And the largest English-speaking country in the world, India, has benefited a lot from that. Uh, the United States is the second largest English-speaking country in the world, and they're also benefiting from it. Uh, and then Fili the Philippines is another uh, semi-English-speaking country, and they're benefiting from from the international call center uh, business, but we're not, even though we're the third largest English-speaking country in the world by population. So we need to access that and we need to access it quickly. Fortunately for us, Lagos has the unique position of having three transatlantic cables landing in Lagos. There's Glow One, there's Main One, and of course there's Sat3, the legacy one that was owned uh, by the old Nitel and is now uh, owned by the successor company. So we need the landlines to come in, not only because of call center jobs and back, uh, back office jobs, but also because of server farms. We need server farms because the millions and millions of websites that originate from Lagos, that belong to Lagos businesses, majority of them are hosted abroad, meaning that we're losing billions every year in revenue that could be coming to companies hosting websites in Lagos. But because we do not have a reliable telecoms backbone, um, we simply uh, have lost out on that. Google, Facebook, and so on, they all have their largest number of customers in Lagos, in Nigeria specifically, uh, in Nigeria generally, but in Lagos specifically. Um, we're losing out because all of these guys do not have server farms here. We need to have co-location centers. We are missing out on that. So we need to uh, quickly 
get our telecoms infrastructure up and running. Yes, GSM is good, but it's not quite good enough for mission critical applications. And that's why we need uh, uh, the hardwired uh, telecoms network. We need jobs. We need jobs for our teaming youths. And um, they're the ones that are most um, advantageously positioned to be able to get the low hanging fruit of, you know, um, network engineering positions, uh, software engineers, and so on and so forth, and also call center operators. So we need to get that sorted. And that is our program for getting jobs in. I've also uh, stated our program for rapid development. Those local governments that we chose, we chose them um, for the LIRP because of uh, a rapid return on investment. We need a quick turnaround. Like I said uh, in another interview, any decision that government makes to invest in infrastructure, uh, utilities and services must be made with return on investment in mind. And as I said, return on investment may not necessarily be monetary. It may be social. It may, you know, it, it may not come to government directly. It, may come st it will usually come straight to the people and then government can benefit from that in terms of jobs created, PAYE, uh, land use charge for commercial premises and so on like that. Um, if we don't invest in our infrastructure, in our services and utilities, then we cannot really be expecting too much by way of revenue. And that's what, has, uh, that's what the government of Lagos has failed to do for the last 20 years. They've not invested properly in infrastructure. Hence, they need to keep squeezing the people and you know, indulging in over-taxation, multiple taxation, which is something that Lagosians are really groaning under at the moment. We're going to be ending that too. Um, all these, uh, this idea that the local government can come and collect one tax for construction and the state government can send multiple agencies to come to, the, to your building site to come and collect all sorts of stuff, that is going to end. We're going to end that. Not that the regulation will stop. We will keep regulating, but not at the sort of huge costs that um, the Lagos state government is currently charging. And in the midst of all that, obviously, by expanding our actual revenue base as opposed to the mirage that we've been experiencing for the last 20 years where they've been stealing from the local government and giving to the state government. By the time we invest as seriously as we plan to in infrastructure, we should see an upward swing in our real internally generated revenue from the uh, expansion of business that will definitely take place. Uh, you know, wherever you build new roads, there are going to be new houses people are naturally going to gravitate to where services are working. So um, we expect that there will be uh, a huge amount of inward investment in Lagos from the private sector, um, both at home and from abroad. As soon as the infrastructure that we're planning to build comes to fruition, and we plan to do all of this within uh, the first 18 months of office, we need to finish with the LIRP, the first set of LIRP local governments within 18 months. Now, how is this possible? in terms of funding, well, we're currently paying uh, a huge amount of money every month to a number of companies called tax consultants. Uh, they tend to do not very much in terms of actually collecting the taxes or funds or revenue or whatever. Um, they simply issue receipts and even the receipts so issued are issued by Lagos State Government uh, civil servants. So the companies are not really doing much for us and yet they're collecting 15% of our revenue. So we're going to stop that and that money that we would have paid to them normally, we dedicate that to the LIRP program. We're also going to be taking cash from the toll gates, which is the reason why we're not going to be phasing out the toll gates as soon as we come into office. We're going to retain them. But the revenue from both the toll gates and all the advertising uh, billboards and hoardings within uh, the Lekki concession area, we're going to uh, harness all of that and direct it towards providing infrastructure in the eight LIRP local governments to develop them as rapidly as possible and give our people as much comfort as we can within the shortest possible period. Once those eight are done, we'll be moving on to uh, the rest of the local governments in Lagos State in terms of redesigning, redeveloping, and uh, uh, installing new infrastructure, uh, services, and utilities. And that is our plan for development in a nutshell. Now, will this road bring all these benefits? And 
you know, just a cursory glance at the potential investment prospects gives a positive answer. It will reduce travel times for commuters along that route. It will encourage inward investment for people who are looking to invest in tourism by reason of access to the beach, which was not available before. And it will bring financial benefit because we'll move the tolls from the Lekki Expressway to the coastal road at two points. One point at the entrance of the road at Igali Ayonide and another one at the exit out of Lagos State at Odeomi. So that you have two points at which you pay tolls on that road. Now those uh, toll receipts, will they be of benefit to Lagosians? And the answer is yes. So it's a win-win situation if we were to invest 70 billion naira, just as an example, in opening up the entire coastal area of Ibejuleki and Etiosa local governments. That's the sort of investment decision that I would like to see government making. But they're not making that kind of investment decision. So you're right to question some of the investments that have been made by government. Sometimes you hear of one or two buildings costing government about two billion or three billion, and then you know they finish building it and they start putting it to use, and you realize that it was a wasted effort. They should never have spent that much money on such a project. A lot of the time, the projects are laden with what we call fat. That is to say they are loaded unnecessarily so that some people can benefit um, unduly from government expenditure. A lot of the projects that they embark on are projects they embark on purely for the purpose of stripping the state of much needed cash straight into their own personal pockets. So, yes, I do have uh, a disagreement with the way government uh, money is being spent and we will be addressing that as soon as we get into office. Baba Tunde Badamosi intends to revive the power and health sectors and also revamp the water networks in all locations where they exist, if elected as governor of Lagos State. I was always a politician right from the UK. Like I said, I was a member of NADECO. Uh, the NADECO Forum uh, UK was an organization that was established to help in the fight for democracy in Nigeria. I was a member of that, I was a frontline member, and we held a number of meetings and had a number of events and helped the NADECO in Nigeria publicize the plight of Nigerians under their Bacha regime. And I think that internationalizing the struggle in that way was one of the reasons why uh, it eventually became successful. And um, that's something that cannot be taken away from us. And it was from that that I naturally gravitated, even after uh, uh, a, a, almost uh, a decade's hiatus, I eventually gravitated back into politics, uh, you know, from business. And, um, you know, I, I've been in politics since, uh, at least 2007, in terms of partisan politics within Nigeria. Yes, we do have some crooks in politics. We even have people who are not in political office but control those in political office by reason of their uh, overbearing influence on political office holders. Now, can we relate with them? Of course we can. We can relate with all politicians. In fact, I'm using this opportunity to reach out to politicians in all political parties in Lagos State, whether you are APC or you are PDP or ADP or MPC or SDP or ADC, any political party for that matter, actually the Alliance for Democracy, if you are a member of any of these parties and you are looking for progress for Lagos State, I'm using this opportunity to reach out a hand of partnership, of fellowship to you. Join me. This is not about, you know, uh, partisan politics. This is about the development of Lagos. And if we are all in this, and I know that many politicians in the ruling party, many politicians in the PDP, many politicians in the uh, uh, Alliance for Democracy, in the SDP, in the ADC, many of these politicians actually honestly do want to see a change. I mean, if you think about it, as a politician, you have a huge number of people on your necks every day, 
asking for cash for this or that. It's either my child is in the hospital or my wife has just given birth, we need to pay for the hospital bills, or I need to pay my children's school fees and so on. We all have these pressures. Now, how do we ease them? How do we ensure that people have access to all the basics so that, you know, you are no longer troubled by the basic needs of all your followers? The answer is to get somebody into office who will fix all the basics and make sure that at least on, this, on, on, the, on the part of education, on the part of healthcare, on the part of uh, water uh, supply, on the part of better roads leading to cheaper transportation, on the part of alternative means of transport, further reducing the cost of transportation in Lagos State and also the travel times. On the part of all the basics, better roads, better drains, and so on and so forth, affordable housing, you know, free healthcare, free education. If these are the things that you are interested in, and you should be interested, because as soon as all these things come into play, the burden that you are carrying will reduce. Whether you are a member of the House of Representatives, or you happen to be a member of the Lagos State House of Assembly, or you happen to be even a simple councillor, you know the stresses that you are going through. The only way to ease those stresses is to make public amenities, utilities and services begin to work for the people so that people will not quite need so much cash to even live from day to day. By the time we fix power, the 700 naira a day that everybody, including your driver, is spending on powering their I better pass my neighbor will be a thing of the past. Okay? Electricity bills, power bills will drop considerably and so will the burden on you. So will expendable, expendable income in the pockets of everybody in Lagos State will increase geometrically according to, you know, in consonance with the amount of uh, investment, real investment, not imagined investment, that we put into public infrastructure, utilities and services. So please join me. That's what I'm asking. All politicians, join the ADP. Work with us. You don't even have to leave your party. Work with us. Some of you cannot leave your political party for fear of your godfathers. I understand that. Work with us. On election day, work with us. Get us elected and you will not regret it. I promise you that. Babatunde aspires to implement the Lagos Regeneration Plan as well as create employment for the youth. The real problem, um, as I see it, is the lack of transparency and accountability in public sector spending. Um, there is a rumor that there is a master plan, um, but I think most Lagosians will confirm that they have never seen the master plan. I have been privileged to see the Lekki master plan, and I know that it was deviated from uh, very substantially enough to um, basically depart almost completely from the master plan as exhibited to people in the last throes of the Tinubu administration between 2006 and 2007. So what we plan to do is to be more transparent. For instance, I can give you a few examples of the lack of transparency. The first one would be the light rail, the Lagos light rail program, the blue line, 27.5 uh, kilometers running from Okoko. Well, it's supposed to run from Okoko and go all the way to CMS. However, as things stand now, it's merely running from mile two uh, to CMS and it was announced in 2009 that the contract had been awarded to the China Railway Construction Company by the Fashola administration at a cost of well over a billion dollars. I think it was 1.5 or 1.4, I can't remember correctly. But it came to my attention that about two years after we commenced uh, the construction of the Blue Line, the government of Ethiopia and the government of Djibouti got together and decided that they needed to modernize the, uh, the Addis Ababa Djibouti railway line uh, from the basic gauge line that it was to a standard gauge line uh, for heavy rail to bring goods and people from the port of Djibouti into the heart of Addis Ababa. That was going to cover a distance of 759 kilometers. 
Now, in 2011, they started construction. By 2016, they had finished 759 kilometers. It was a complete rebuild, uh, along with brand new stations, I think about 15 stations in total, along that route. Um, the long and short is that they gave their contract to the same China Railway construction company that we gave our contract to, and somehow they managed to finish 759 kilometers in five years. As I'm speaking to you, they already started using the rail service as early as January 2018 after testing it throughout 2017. The Lagos light railway line, however, is uncompleted as we speak, 10 years after it started. And the reason for that, again, is accountability. And I'll come to that very quickly. The CRCC themselves published a first quarter report in 2010, which they submitted to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. I got a hold of that document by doing a simple search on Google for Lagos Blue Line and CRCC, and that document came up. I read through it, and on page 9, I saw where the CRCC uh, listed the Lagos Light Railway project as one of the projects they had won overseas. And in that paragraph on page 9, the last paragraph, I saw where they stated that the value of the contract for the red and the blue line uh, was 1.256 billion B, which loosely translated back to the dollar came to about $182 million. Now, when I recalled that uh, the Fashola administration had said they paid one point something billion dollars for the blue line alone, that set alarm bells ringing in my head. You know? So I went back to look at the cost of the Ethiopia railway, and I discovered that that was at about 5.2 million US dollars per kilometer. And when I did the figures for our own uh, light railway, I realized that it came to about 54 million US dollars per kilometer. Now that kind of discrepancy in the sum claimed by the contractor and the sum claimed by uh, state officials is deeply worrying. I'm very worried by it and I, I, I wonder how many such contracts were so inflated by the government of that time and indeed by the government that has followed subsequently and what will happen when the godfather is able to install his next uh, minion as governor of Lagos State. Now we know that th that position is merely ceremonial as far as the godfather is concerned. You know, uh, the governors, as they were, are more or less just figureheads, and the real decisions emanate from Bodilon, and they must be followed to the letter. So we are at this crossroads where we must look very closely at our public expenditure once again. The Lekki Ekbe Expressway uh, is one that particularly caught my interest many years ago. And upon closer investigation, I realized that at 23 kilometers expansion, it came out at around 5.8 billion naira per kilometer. That's 16.6 .6 million US dollars per kilometer. 16.6 .6 million US dollars per kilometer. Bear in mind that the Addis Ababa to Djibouti rail line cost 5.2 million US dollars per kilometer. Now, by contrast, if you look at the private project uh, instituted by the Dangote refinery um, and being executed by Julius Berger, no less, that cost them 250 million naira per kilometer for 44 kilometers of dual carriageway expressway within the refinery premises. Of course, the refinery is about 20,000 hectares in size, so that will be understandable that they will need that much in terms of roads. But the point is, it cost them 250 million per kilometer. So, in essence, what was spent allegedly by LCC on the Lekki Express we could have gotten us about 500 kilometers of road. 500. And what was spent allegedly by Lagos State Government on the Blue Line alone could have gotten us. 277 kilometers of railway line. So my point is, if we spend more prudently, then we will get more for our tax naira. And that's the direction in which I plan to push uh, government. As a businessman myself, I could never spend my money the way uh, the Lagos State government of the last two decades 
has, you know, recklessly lavished our money on all sorts of questionable transactions. For Babatunde or Lalerik Badamosi, the most important people in all of these are the people of Lagos. He believes it is time for a change, and that change he can deliver. The people of Dubai do not have two heads. The people of London do not have two heads. The people of New York do not have two heads. The only thing they have that we don't is good leadership. And that's what I represent in Lagos, good leadership. I invested a billionaire in the bush, and now we know how much it's worth. It's worth a lot more. And in terms of benefit that it's brought to people and the jobs that we've been able to generate from it, long-term jobs, I think we've done very, very well. Give me an opportunity to do the same thing, albeit on a much larger scale, for Lagos State. And you'll be glad you did. Vote Babatunde Olaleri Badamosi for Governor of Lagos State. Vote ADP, Action Democratic Party.